Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Rekka Comics webcast. Uh, Rekka Comics is a Black Hills company. And if you're like, what? Uh, yeah. So at some point, John is a serial entrepreneur, and uh, he likes to do things that bring him joy. And so I wondered, John, would you like to start a comic book company? And he was like, yes. Uh, so we'll go ahead and talk about all those things here today. And I think one of our interns just showed up. So I think it's a game. Yeah. A little aggressive. All right. So to give you an idea of how all this came to be, uh, we're, hey, Gabe, I'm on a webcast. <laughs> Hi, Gabe. Right. <laughs> so to find out how all these things came to be, we got the Record Comics timeline here. And what happened was in November of 2021, we released our first prompt zine. And so if you've never read prompt, it's an infosec zine that John had asked for for about two years. And I had no idea how to <laughs> do it. And so finally, one day I was like, what if we take all these other ideas we have and we put it together in a print magazine that we then send to people for free? And the idea was like fantastic. And so in, in that, we included an 11 page comic book inside the zine. So that way we could start making comics. Uh, we worked with Joe Eisma and a new writer. Uh, it was her very first gig. And she's like, I can do this. And we're like, OK. Uh, and so we told the story of John's mom breaking into a prison. And so that was how we got started telling the story of when John's mom broke into a prison, which is a fantastic story. It's in Wired magazine. It's a, it's a Darknet Diaries episode. It is wonderful. It is a tearjerker. It is fantastic. And we turned it into a comic book and it was successful. It was good. So then we did it again. We published another issue of prompt and we put another comic. Hey, John. Hey. Hey, John. Hey. Made it. So, John, we just crossed $19,000 with 91 backers. Uh, if you're watching the recording, hopefully we've crossed more than that since by the time you watch this. Uh, and, John, thanks for being here. I was just going through the timeline of how all this came to be. And so if you want to inter interject at any point, we got Fred with us. We got Adam with us. Serena's here. Deb's here. And Anthony, part of the Piranha team, is here, too. Awesome. So we, we made the comics inside the prompt scene, and then... After making some comics, and we're like, I think we can do this. Uh, so I pitched internally to John and his wife, Erica. And I was like, I think we can make this an actual company. And so the original idea was for us to make comics about hackers telling kind of the stories that we can't tell because we can't talk about our clients. We can't talk about all the things that we do, but we do cool and fun stuff. And so if they did it throughout the characters, then we could meld a bunch of things together and tell fun stories. So that was the original idea. And the goal was to make great comic books that happen to be about cybersecurity, not cybersecurity comics, because uh, we've seen other companies try to make cybersecurity comics and we're, we're not a fan. Uh, so the goal was to make great comics that happen to be about cybersecurity. John, do you remember that meeting? I do. I do. It was one of those things. If we couldn't, if we couldn't get the right um, like artists and authors in to assist with all of it and get the right story, um, we just we just don't want to do because there's so many comics that corporations put out, and they're like, you know what I would really like is I would like to have a superhero that saves the day through the power of Walmart, <laughs> and that's just going to be a bad comic all the way through. I kind of wonder if that's a real comic now. Uh, it so probably is. So I'm going to find it and keep going. Yeah. So after a couple of months, seeing if we could do this ourselves, we came to the conclusion that we could not and keep doing the same things that we were doing, like prompts and some other stuff that we were working on. And so we brought Prana in. And so that's where Adam comes from. So Adam, can you tell me what Prana is, your background, you know, what you've been doing in comics, how we met, stuff like that, you know, complimentary things about me. <laughs> oh, sure. I think I, I think I might have. Well, I have to dig deeper for that, those, the last one. But um. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, my name is Adam Freeman. Uh, I actually I've been working in comics one form or another for about 30 years. Uh, worked in a comic book store, then owned a comic book store. Um, we won uh, the Eisner called the, the Eisner Spirit of Retail Awards, an international awards given out to one shop every year. So for one year, our shop was the greatest shop in the world. Um, then right around that time is when I met Jason. Jason was also a comic book retailer at the time and uh, was doing what he does here, but for kind of comics retailers, teaching them how the power of what social media could be. And this was like 2008, 2009, right in that area. So it was, it was a little revolutionary. Uh, this idea that you could, you know, use uh, social media to sell your local comic shop. And Jason and I really just hit it off. We became friends. <laughs> I visited their store in Florida several times and uh, done a lot of work with his uh, ex-partner, Aaron Holland. 
And anyway, all of this to say, uh, I then moved on to publishing. I've been working now in publishing for about, I don't know, 15, 16 years for several different companies. Uh, in 2018, I decided to open my own shop, a place called Prana Direct Market Solutions. Uh, direct market re really focuses on the uh, what we, that's what we call the the network of comic book shops around around the globe is the direct market for many boring reasons that I won't get into. So I wanted to build a company that really focused on you know sales and marketing, but also you know later it really became about you know producing comics. It became about every step of operations, production, editorial. So. When Jason came to me with this, uh, you know, it was obvious when I mean, we always wanted to work together. So it, ma it made a whole lot of sense um, in, in getting involved with this. And then and if I'm remembering correctly, originally it was just we were just kind of consulting. We're like, here's how you make your own comic book company. Mm -hmm. um, and you guys were out there doing it. And it was, you know, you guys made some really great comics. I think Bear versus Bear is super fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jeremy, Jeremy from marketing. Marketing, did I get that right? Yeah, uh, yep. you guys did great work. So we, and then you know, you came to us to about getting more involved, and that was even that was an obvious thing. But I feel like I'm getting ahead of your timeline. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So Adam comes in, and now we're like we we put an actual like budget together, and we're like we're gonna do this comic book. And then what happened was John called me, and John was like. I, I feel like we should go in this direction with it. So John, uh, I have a part in here where you can actually do your whole slides, uh, but okay. what was the quick pitch? And then eventually, you know, in a couple of slides, we'll get deep uh, into let it. Let me know when you want me to go into the slides, but um, I really, really, really like the idea of near future and kind of trying to figure out where technology is going to go and how that's going to impact our lives. And seriously, when we are looking at what's coming down the line. There's nothing that I know of like looking near future. What are the implications of security going to be? Um, especially as it relates to the problems that we have now. So really trying to tie that in. And then I'm a huge fan of anything that deals with augmented or virtual reality. And really we had some just rough sketches and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to geek on, I'm going to geek on Fred here in a little bit, but I'll wait for that appropriate time, but really trying to find the right writer. Um, and also Nate was awesome that we could get in a room and, you know, Fred, Nate, and um, working with Adam and Jason in, in the basement in New York was actually, I, I know this sounds goofy, but it was one of the funnest experiences in my entire professional career. So, and I want to get back out there guys. Like I really want to get back out there like badly. So. Sadly, the basement is no more. We'll have to find a new basement. Yeah. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll, we'll get somewhere. We'll get somewhere. So, yeah. so originally, uh, I'll talk about this and we're getting there, but uh, we were going to go to a co working space. And John's like, if it's a bunch of glass and like, if, silver, it's, if it's like, like we work, I'm, I'm done. I don't yeah. want to do this. But it was the basement of a dungy like comic book store in Brooklyn. It was, it was awesome. Fantastic. You had to go down these stairs that were right next to, there was these stairs in between. At the time I was in the basement, that was where my office was. And so we had a little meeting space in that, in there, that area where they do a lot of gaming and a lot of art classes and stuff. But if you're coming in early in the morning, which we were, you have to go down these stairs in this alleyway uh, that's right next to this chicken joint. So everything is covered in chicken grease. You're going to slide yeah. down these stairs. I did it once. It was, yeah. Oh, it was real New York you guys came to, right? But it was also like the scene in Goodfellas where uh, he's about to get made, about to get made, uh, mm -hmm. but it doesn't get made. So it was very it much like get made. Oh, yeah, just down these stairs, just just down here. And I was like, if, if I don't get invited to New York next time, I'm boycotting. I said this exact same thing. Okay, okay. <laughs> so Deb and Serena. Okay, so a little bit of background about that because this whole webcast about this whole thing. So Jason was worried about the costs, right? You know, he, mm -hmm. he's worried about it. He took a train to mm -hmm. get there, and he walked half. I'm not joking. Halfway across New York to try to keep costs down. I'm mad at him for that. So next time we all get together, we're going to get the whole band together. You you all are coming. It's going to be. Jason, you didn't even rent the Andrew. like bikes they have? Uh, the no. Yeah. He, no had I gear. he had gear. He had no. gear. Yeah. yeah, I walked. Yeah. And I'm like, Jason, get a cab for the love of God. Get a cab. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it's now January 2023. So if you realize that we're now in April of 2024, so January 23, and that's when we bring in Fred and Nate. And then that's when we meet in the basement was February 9th, 2023. 
And since then, uh, well, let's talk about that. Uh, John, we'll, we'll talk about your stuff in a second. I want to give a little backstory. Like we did start making comics with the prompt stories. We got Rita, the prison story. We got Ralph, the TV station story, and an unpublished one from uh, Steve, which will be in a future issue of prompt. And so that one deals with EMS. Like we were making comics. And then at this point, we were like, oh, we should make Bear vs. Bear. Uh, so if you don't know what Bear vs. Bear is, it's our first comic where uh, we had accidentally made two comics, uh, two bears. Uh, we had made Ransom Bear, which was the bad guy. And we had made Blue Bear, which is on our blue team shirts. Uh, and so we're like, what if they fought? And so we took the Log4J scenario from a few years ago. And we used that as like the symbolic fight between the two of them. But what we did is we were like, what if we had a, a CTF where you could actually do log4j vulnerability and exploit and things like that. And so that's where like all this stuff starts coming together. Like we're like, what if we create a CTF in it? What if we make this? What if we do these things? And so as it starts to evolve, then we work with uh, Jack from Darknet Diaries and we do a collab with him and Tinker to like, well, let's tell a real hacker story. Let's tell the story of Jeremy and marketing, which is my favorite episode of Darknet Diaries. And so we tell this story and that just goes, it does really well. We mailed out 7,000 free copies oh. of this uh, to all the subscribers of Prompt. Uh, we got it out to people. Jack does uh, signings of this comic now. He's got lines that are like hours long and hundreds of people show up. And so this has been really cool. We're, we're planning to make one more Darknet Diaries uh, issue or episode into a comic that is in progress. But that leads us to John's slides. Mm -hmm. So John, I'm going to turn it over to you for you to do your own slides. I'm going to stop sharing. So John's going to give you the backstory of like what he presented to Fred and then what Fred did with it. Uh, so John at some point was like, okay, I got some ideas. Uh, and yeah. so he put together a slide deck and he recorded a video for it and then sent it to all of us. And then that became like the basis of what we did when we met in the basement in Brooklyn. So John. And, and, and I'm cut, I've cut out a couple of redundant slides, but I've got some, I'm going to get through it. Originally, we were thinking about calling it Vuln. So this was completely set up to be talking to prospective authors and um, kind of want to go through it very, very, very quickly. Um, one of the things that we wanted to establish was when we're creating the sandbox universe, like what are some of the rules, right? And so much of the science fiction that's out there is bad. And this is one of those things in the basement. We started talking about some maybe modern science fiction and how much it sucked and it wasn't actually science fiction and it wasn't even really good literature, uh, good art even. So we really wanted to get back to the gist of what if. You know, whenever you say, what if we have augmented reality? What if we continue down the exact same path for technology that we've been working on? And what is that future going to look like? And what is the impact of that future on individuals? Uh, one of the story arcs that we're currently working on is what, what if all tractors are completely DRM'd and you have to continue to pay a fee to be able to run your tractor to run your business? And if you don't, all of a sudden that tractor doesn't work. That's already happening right now with John Deere. Where does that end up? And we really wanted to find people that could collaborate with us and have those types of conversations and really geek out and push some things back and forth with each other. So we use the company Black Mountain as a security company as the vehicle for this. Yes, I know. It's, I know, I, I, I know. Okay, it is what it is, right? But we had to name the company. And they basically break into places, do what hackers do. And we wanted to have a diverse set of skills, right? Not just a bunch of cyber hackers and doing those things. We wanted to have people that are doing social engineering, physical capabilities uh, to try to break in. Maybe some background with military and law enforcement. Maybe we'll do some incident response stuff in the comics as well, where they're reacting against attackers uh, that are out there. Now, one of the things that I've been really interested in is kind of looking at how is the future going to look if we have things like augmented reality, right? And uh, I think one of the best books about this is the Atopia series. And uh, the Atopia series, augmented reality is just baked into most people. It's actually jacked into the way that we view the world. And there's an overlay of IT in everything that you see in the universe, right? And there's another great book I'm reading right now. What is the name of it? Uh, the Deep Sky, where it's people traveling in space and they have augmented reality to make the spaceship feel like they're 
in a field somewhere. So it stops them from going crazy with the basic starkness of a spaceship. So that's something that I like, right? That's something like what is going to happen to us when we're looking at our relationship with technology and whenever augmented reality is a thing and to a lesser extent, some virtual reality um, out there as well. Now we have a lot of technologies that have been failures, right? Like meta was a failure and all those different things. And really, how do we actually get to that point? And I'll talk about that more a little bit later. Um, we could have the society, I said, you can make the society on the verge of a total complete collapse. Something like The Unincorporated Man was a great novel about uh, like a complete total societal collapse. And what does that look like whenever people are so immersed in the technology that they stop being human beings out there as well? Um, augmented reality, though, even though people look at Meta and what, what Apple is doing, it hasn't been a failure, actually. Um, it has been a failure in the perspective of mass technologies. And I have seen people already in airports wearing the new Apple augmented reality. So it's starting to get some level of traction that's out there. But we're also seeing augmented reality in people's work. Google Glass failed. It never went away. There's a bunch of jobs that use augmented reality glasses to assist people in doing their jobs. That's happening. The technology is still progressing. It's still working. It's still going forward. So when you're looking at these glasses, it could be contact lenses. Uh, Mojo lens is a series of glasses that'll do an overlay, like a HUD, like you're running and they'll show you that in your field of vision. And when we're thinking of that, and this is one of the things we were talking about with the uh, authors and the artists, how do we relate to that world and how do we document that in the form of a comic so people can identify what is real and what is not? And this is one of those great conversations. And I think that the artistic team just knocked it out of the park for showing that difference between what is real and what is actually augmented reality. Now, here's the thing for all of you geeks, people that do computer security every day. The future is going to be built on the exact same technologies that we are using today. The reason why I feel comfortable saying that is because today is built on the exact same technologies that were developed 20, 30 years ago. So these technologies are not going away. If you're looking at like TCP, IP, UDP, quick protocol, SCTP, port services, protocols, all of that is still going to be present in the future technologies. So that means that a lot of the attacks, a lot of the hacks, a lot of the different things that you and I and all of us that are on this webcast deal with on a continuous basis, there's still going to be those vulnerabilities that exist. And you see things like when something techie needs to happen, pick up the phone and call us. And this has been awesome with the authors and, and even the artists, like we need to do something techie here. What can we do? And we'll be like, well, we could do this particular attack. They're like, that's great but that's a lot of jargon that no one's going to understand. How can we boil it down to something that a general reader would be able to understand? And then of course we can then sneak in where you can do the hacks. And I'll talk more about that in just a little bit out there as well. AI is a thing. And this is one of those absolutely delightful things that happened with the comic. Um, I don't want to get into it too much, but AI is definitely incorporated but instead of it being like this thing that's utilized, it's been turned into a character or characters that are part of this universe. And I think, uh, I, you know, like I said, I'm going to geek out on Fred a little bit here. I don't know if he's still on. Um, but going out to New York, I would go through and I would download all the comics for prospective authors. And I downloaded a bunch of Fred stuff. And um, one of the things I love that Fred does is Fred's weird. Okay. I'm just going to throw <laughs> that out there. All right. If there is a straight line between two things, he's not going to hit it as a straight line. He's going to incorporate some odd things into it. And there's been this oddness that's come out and like how the AI is represented and how it it's mobile in the real world is just absolutely chef's kiss. And uh, the thing I love about Fred is he's constantly annotating what he's writing and he's talking about where he's seeing an article where this type of thing shows up and it's just really, really cool. So instead of artificial intelligence being effing lame like the net, don't ever watch that movie. It's bad. It's so bad. AI feels like a character. AI feels like something that is an interesting aspect of the novel that isn't, or the graphic novels that isn't the only thing. It isn't the protagonist or the antagonist. It's part of the background and the texture of the comic that's out there. 
ad tech, all of this stuff, people are going to have to pay for. And there's going to be very large corporations and very large corporations doing very bad large corporation type things, you know, data brokers, ad tech, just about anything you want for anybody I can buy now for five freaking dollars. And it was really cool to sit down in the basement and demonstrate some of the techniques that we use at Black Hills Information Security to the writers. And, uh, you know, they were like, excuse me, what? Like for $5, you can get all of my loans, my social security number, the street I grew up on, my mother's maiden name. Like, yes, that's the cost of your privacy, you know? And these are things that are great because if you put it in the hand of a really good author, that author can take those ideas and play them out in a way that like I couldn't because I'm in the technology all the time. So they can have like a more creative view and expansive view on how this actually is set up out there as well. Um, general security, some companies are harder to get into. Some organizations are more difficult. Finance, R&D, legal. The other thing is the larger a company is, the easier it is to break into that corporation because they have a larger attack surface. And that's something the team in this comic book, the protagonists or with an asterisk, I guess, they're going to encounter that. So in the comic, you're going to see them do a hack and we're going to incorporate that in partnership with MetaCTF. You'll be able to do that hack that was in the comic. So it makes it more realistic and accessible for people to say, well, this is just hand-waving, hacking, do sex machina. It's like, no, 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 no. L literally, you can do that thing that they did. You can do that over here. And that ties in to what we're seeing every single day. Um, I say the browser on this slide, uh, the AR interface and how that sets up and how you can put plugins and you can do all these different things actually plays a big part in one of the character arcs and how hacking works in someone's interface. It may not be called a browser, but if you're looking at someone's rig, you can add plugins, you can do things. And we already have in the narrative, we have a character who's trying to do a plugin to take back control of her AR life. And spoiler, it doesn't go well, but that gets into another character arc that I don't want to spoil quite yet in there as well. And also one of the things that we set out that we wanted desperately to have is you have an episode, a personal story, and a mythology. And uh, once again, I, I think the team just absolutely rocked this, just did such a good job where we have all three of these characteristics like in the X-Files, where if you're reading a comic, it's an episode. There's a personal story, but it ties into a larger mythology that we're going to be following all the way through the original graphic novel. So absolutely excited about this. And like I said, you know, I, I spent a, a lot of time downloading all of these comics from Fred and uh, the, the dude is just quirky. Um, I love it. It's not a straight line and um, in like collaborating back and forth uh, from the basement to going back and forth on all these different things. You know, he has just amazing ideas that he brings to the table and he's open to where other people have ideas and they can pull that and he can synthesize those in in many ways, reflect it back better than we described it. There's many times I just feel like I'm a monkey describing an automobile to Fred. And then Fred creates this amazing kind of story arc around it. And more importantly, what he's doing with that story arc is he gives it like this, this wonderful canvas that the artists just go crazy with and the art that they're generating. Um, Cause he'll have like the dialogue and everything, but then he'll have like a paragraph describing what he wants to see. And it's vivid enough that the artist can pick it up and run with it. So that's, uh, that's my slide decks. And I kept some things out just for the sake of time. i um, going to stop sharing now, but, uh, but no, that's kind of what I said is like, this is the sandbox come in and play. And uh, it was, wow. It, they came in and played. Yeah. So moving on. Thank you, John. Uh, like that gave us all the context that led to the basement time, <laughs> basement time. That sounds basement time. Yeah. yeah. That, that didn't come out right. Uh, but that time that in the basement so uh, where we were coming up with. So, Fred, after the time in the basement where we, as the people who are immersed in cybersecurity all day long, we even showed you backdoors and breaches at some point. Like we took you through like here's initial compromise. Here's pivot and escalate. Here's X, you know, C2 and XFIL. Here's here's you know persistence. We showed you all these things about cybersecurity. We talked about all the things that scare the heck out of us and what the future might look like. And we had debates about this, that and everything else. We then said, okay, go, Fred. So what happened next, Fred? 
Uh, you mean after I escaped the basement? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you get, you guys gave me a lot of great stuff to read. Um, that's always a huge part of my process is doing research and stuff. And thank you, John, for all the wonderful my, things you said. My head is now 20 times bigger, uh, but it's much appreciated. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, my background isn't in tech, although I've done, I've worked in video games. I've worked for Marvel forever. And so did a lot of video games with Marvel through Disney and stuff. Um, but um, uh, when you read stuff with a storytelling eye, I think the difference between people who do stuff practically in technology and people who write stories for a living is there's an old saying that happy people make for bad drama. Like tech people are looking for ways to, to deescalate conflict. Uh, when you're a storyteller, it's all about conflict. So I'm always looking, where are the problems? Where can I poke holes in this? So, you know, particularly for new future uh, infotech based stuff, the touchstone for a lot of people and certainly for me is the Netflix show Black Mirror. You can't just help. You can't not talk about Black Mirror when you're talking about this stuff. Uh, and I can't claim to have seen every Black Mirror episode, but what's different about TFI, uh, the future is, um, versus Black Mirror is it's a different genre, right? Black Mirror is essentially a horror show, right? So it's about people trapped in bad circumstances. What's great about our team of hackers, our Black Mountain hackers in TFI is, is they get you out of those situations, right? So it's it's you're adding a, a some something of a heroic element to it, even though they're kind of uh very much working in the shadows um and they're not sort of you know they're i guess the, the term of art is white hat hackers right but still they're very much operating on the fringes of the of uh of uh legality like the other thing i keep think of this is an old school concept but like if you guys know anything about pulp here is like the shadow which predated batman who had these network of agents and always working outside the law and were sometimes as scary, if not scarier than the criminals they were fighting. That's kind of another big, so I guess it's black mirror meets the shadow. Does that make sense? That's, yeah. that's sort of what I ended up coming up with. That's the world I really wanted to do. Um, and so we talked a lot about the surveillance state. Uh, one of the characters, Martina has to escape from a husband who basically has controlled every aspect of her life through AR. That's a major storyline. Um, we have a character, Sally, who has basically given Earth the middle finger and decided to go live uh, in orbit and do her hacking from orbit. The problem, though, is when you go hacking in orbit and you're outside the law, that means the corpos, if they want to, can come after you and no one's going to stop them. So she has a she has a slight killer robot problem that she has to deal with in, in her story. Um, and then, you know when you have so much wealth and, and power concentrated uh, in, in some of these uh, tech sectors in our, in the main storyline, the lunar casino storyline, we've got a bunch, we, we have uh, people three days away from earth and any accountability um, when it's time to go hack a casino on the moon. Uh, it's not just physically dangerous for characters. They're just kind of going out in the middle of nowhere. They're basically going to a place where uh, you have a guy running a moon base as a, as a pleasure palace combination bunker. So, uh, so that's, uh, that was super exciting. So, so it's all this stuff is in the realm of possibility, you know, um, there aren't any lightsabers or, uh, transporter machines, but uh, I just noticed, I just noticed our Kickstarter started going down actually, once you said no <laughs> lightsabers, that's just, we're Here's adding writer. lightsabers in. Writer. He's talking too much. We're, we're adding <laughs> lightsabers back in. Don't go that's away. Right. <laughs> and for the ten thousand dollar tier, we'll build you a lightsaber. <laughs> uh, you're very young, uh, but it's been super fun, and it's been such a great learning experience. Working with Neo, the artist, has been fantastic, and just every every bizarre question um, I've asked of Black Hills, you guys have given me great answers. And Adam, you two have come with some great stuff. Like, you know, uh, Adam sent me an article about. Microsoft is building servers in the bottom of uh, the Orkney Sea, I think it is. It's somewhere in Great Britain in the in the bottom of the ocean. So uh, we have a uh, our graphic novel opens with a uh, a sea hack and a scuba hack, which is hopefully a first, you know, in this genre. So it's 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 exciting because we get to keep uh adding more and more stuff and 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 the world of tech obviously is always inventing new stuff and then we just get to take it and put our own crazy fun exciting comic twist on it 
Fred, can you add the part about sprites? Because in yes. this world, everyone has their own personal AI. And so what, what are the sprites? Yeah. So the part one, you know, one of the challenges of, of, you know, hacking and fiction is, you know, not to offend anybody, but it's not too much fun to, to show 23 panels of a guy hunched over a computer, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of Dilberting it or whatever. Uh, so uh, uh, to add a more interesting visual element, I hit on the idea of having everybody um, have sort of personal assistance, AR assistance that are their mediation between the uh, cyberspace and meat space. And so that's fun. So we let the main character is a wolf and mostly they're animals. Eli, who's kind of, who's, the strangest of the bunch has this weird like five nights at Freddy's type, you know, plush monster called Tuffy that his his it's sort of the combination of like Tinkerbell meets, you know, Surrey uh, or something. I don't know. Yeah, like an animal sidekick. Yeah, they're usually yeah. animals, but not always. Yeah. Yeah. So when we get the script in, so Fred writes the script, Adam takes a look at it, sends it to us, then we have a table read. Uh, where we work. So Serena, Deb, John, and myself, uh, we will sit down and we'll actually go through and we'll be the characters as we go through. And it is fun. And I wish we would have recorded them because uh, it's us like, so, and then this time, I did. <laughs> like we go through and we do all the characters and then we're like, is this how a person would talk? And is this how this would talk? And this is how, and so Serena and Deb are there for to make sure that we are telling the best story we possibly can. So Serena, can you talk about like when you get a chance to read the script and like what we're looking for is, is this accurate? Does this make sense? And is this good for the community? What was, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> when we get the scripts in, like what's the experience for like you as you're reading through the script? Um. Well, I think the interesting thing to me is that like, uh, I mean, I read a lot of books, but I don't read a lot of comics and I definitely don't read a lot of like not produced comics with like the art. So it is a little bit different because you just have the words and you have like a description of what the panel is going to be. And so you really have to use like a lot of visualization uh, for that. And so it is kind of interesting to go about it that way. Um, since a lot of the comics use those photos as like the heavy lifting for the description. Does that make sense? Like in books, there's, it's more like written. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a script. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a blueprint as opposed yeah. to a house. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's cool to, to kind of go through it and get to know the characters. And then when you actually like see the art on it, it's like very exciting, but yeah, there's definitely some tweaks and, and things here and there, um, especially when it comes to like the technical part and trying to make it semi-accurate, like this is sci-fi, but I, I produce enough content in this community to know that people are gonna be like, ah, well, <laughs> you know? And so that is something that like, I at least consciously think about when I'm going through it is, you know, kind of like the technical details. Yeah. And Deb, when we're doing these read throughs, like mm -hmm. I know that you get, I don't wanna get too ahead, but you actually like get excited <laughs> and you start like talking like the, anyway, what's it like for you to do the table reads? I mean, you just go ahead and tell, tell them what it's like for me. Um, so I like Serena love reading. And like she said, it is a challenge to, it just takes time. It took time for me to get into like, oh, okay, I'm actually reading a script. Like you said, the images usually do the heavy lifting in a comic. Um, I loved the table read so much. I wish we would have recorded it. It was so much fun. I loved um, shocking John with my uh, accurate uh, cuss word saying of some of the uh, the scenes it's so um, weird it's so weird we should have had it recorded just for that <laughs> i just love so it we can have a, a a nice like master cut of just dead yeah, just, just, just dead, dead swearing saying. yes swearing. so it fred i guess what we're saying is we need more cuss words yeah. that female <laughs> characters say so we can create that super cut yeah. Yeah. that was great yeah no i really yeah. wish we could have recorded it it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. yeah all right so once we get the script in we take it we give some notes we give those notes to adam and then adam helps us make sure that we're not weird about our notes so adam uh fred you may not know all these things but like sometimes we're like well what about this and what about this and why is that like this and so adam's like this go-between between us and fred so 
Adam, explain how notes happen in the world of comic books. Well, I think that uh, one of the things that uh, people who are just fans of comics don't realize is how collaborative they can be, right? We, in, when we were in that basement in Brooklyn, it's uh, what's known as a writer's retreat, right? We all get together and we're talking about problems and those problems are being solved by telling stories. It's really a beautiful process because it's so collaborative. It's just people telling stories together. Uh, continuing on with that, like everything that comes through here is, you know, it is the vision of the group, but it comes out of Fred. Fred is uh, Fred is the, the the generator of the story. He is the engine behind it. And, you know, we can feed him the, the right gas and we can feed him the right oil. He's going to be creating the actual energy of this of this book. And so when we have notes, the whole crew gets together and we all talk about it. That's where I think the real, the kind of generous act of saying, okay, have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? It's not, we want this to say, this person to say that. We, it's, it's, you know, in this particular instance, you're solving a problem with story. Have you considered this idea on this story? And then that those notes go back to Fred and he then filters it again through, uh, through where he's, you know, through his technique and his ability and all of his years of experience and all, all, all of the books that he's already produced. So it is a collaborative effort, uh, but it's also very much a singular effort. So it, there's a balance in between and you have to know how to give that line, that read that, that note without it being a line reading, you know, yeah. don't say it this way. Right. So you don't want to be, you don't want to be Kevin Smith where everybody starts talking like Kevin Smith. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And Fred, you've done a great job of like when we were like, well, in our community or in this industry or things, and you've either explained why you're doing something, we're like, oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, or you're like, yeah, that makes sense. I'll change it. So, so the goal here, just any note that we give, any like suggestion that is to make the best possible comic for you who is reading it. Like that's the whole collaborative environment. It's like, what is best for you, the reader, that's going to have the best story you can possibly read and enjoy? Uh, so let's go into art. All right. So once the script is done, uh, then it goes, well, actually, this is what a script looks like. I didn't want to show, show this, this is what a script looks like. This is what we get. It's actually not exactly what we get because we get like a nicer <laughs> version than this. Uh, but this is what the Mac version of like, would you like to open up a Word doc in this stupid Mac version of Word? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, fine. Uh, but this is PDF if you want, if that's yeah. easier. Uh, so this is what the script looks like. Uh, this is what we get. And then it becomes this. So those words right there uh, are given to the artist. And then it becomes this. And so these are pencils and inks. Anthony, walk us through like what it's like, because you're like the coordinator for a lot of this stuff. Like you're the first line of like, you're the one that sends me like, Jason, we got new inks in, we got new pencils and we got new coloring in, we got new this and we got that. In. Uh, so walk me through like, how does this process work as far as like an editorial publishing? Yeah, so when once we get new assets in, uh, whether it's a script or the pencils and inks, uh, any character designs or whatnot, we uh, like the Prana team will take a look at it, uh, kind of check it against what the initial prompt was. Like, for example, with these pages, we would pull up the script and we'll kind of look at the pages side by side make sure that everything's kind of tracking. Uh, we deliver those to you guys uh, so that you guys can go through and review as well. Um, and we also will go through and kind of start doing our notes, right? Is, is this conveying the right thing in this panel? Is this uh, is there a better way to spotlight something? Um, and that ends up being kind of a, a thorough process. Um, Adam already talked about like just the note process in general, but it's really just how many like uh, layers of notes there are, right? Or how many screening attempts there are. So we, we get these pages in, uh, we, we catalog them, uh, you know, we, we have our, our archive system for it um, to be able to quickly access and update new versions as we get updates in. Um, after everybody's had a chance to discuss the notes, uh, we go back to the team uh, with Fred and Nate uh, and Ennio, uh, Andrea and even Taylor at the letter. Uh, we go back to them with the notes. Um, at that point, they also will receive those notes and say, uh, yes, we can go ahead and do this, or no, this isn't going to work for this or this, you know, this reason or another. Uh, and then uh, if, if anything's going to be executed, goes back to the team, they do their, their part, 
uh, comes back in and we just kind of repeat until we, uh, till we get everything right. Yeah. Lots of steps, mm -hmm. lots of part of the puzzle, like, you know, for pencils and coloring and everything else, like there's a lot of steps and there's yeah. opportunities for misinterpretations in every single step. Uh, and so that's when we get the work in and, and we go through as a team. And a lot of times Prana gets it first and they're like, Hey, we have a series of notes. And I'm like, whatever you got, I'm good with it. Like, yeah. Well, it's not even it, opportunities for mistakes is, is true, but there's also opportunities for refinement. But, you know, one of the things that we say a lot in Prana is if there's an opportunity for even a 1% increase in the quality of, the, of this book, we should give the note. We should have that conversation. That 1% is worth it. Um, it is, you know, it is not often, there are many, many publishing houses that, you know, just bypass that whole process. And I, and we really find that if you put the time and effort in and you have the conversation, and again, it is just a conversation with the creators. Have you thought of this? Can we recommend that? Then it it does go to the overall quality of the book. Yeah. What I found really interesting about like this process in comics is actually, it feels tech adjacent, right? This kind of feels like a scrum or like agile kind of like you, you get the best product in, you go through, you see like where the issues are and you just keep iterating until you get it right. Unlike, you know, in tech where you, you get to deploy some sort of patch after it's printed, you don't really get that freedom, but the entire process is kind of like patching and iterating uh, with constant improvements. And uh, it's so important, like everybody, in this team, uh, the record team, the rep Fred and all the creative team. It's so important that like egos kind of like left at the door, right? Like the notes, like Jason hit on, it's about making the best thing for the reader. Mm -hmm. So when those notes are given, they're never to be like, somebody did this wrong. It's, Hey, we think this could be better. And somebody else goes, yeah, you're right. It could be better. Let's do that. And not, uh, but I wanted it this way. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's really an important Part of working with it and really an amazing quality to find with this group of people yeah so if you're wondering why it's been a year and like three months <laughs> since that morning in uh in in february where we met in the basement like this is what we've been doing since then mm -hmm. uh so next once you have done the inks and and uh, pencils then we go to the coloring phase so if you take a look now you'll see that on the left hand side of the screen it was colored and on the right hand side mm -hmm. It was colored again, and you may not be able to notice the difference, but Adam did. And <laughs> Adam, uh, so when the first coloring came in, we we're like, this looks good. And Adam's like, I feel like we can make some improvements. Uh, and so Adam went back and made, uh, asked for suggestions for improvements with the colorist. And so what you see on the right hand side is the improved colors. Now, you may not be able to tell the difference, but once again, we are doing everything we can to increase this by 1% or 2% or 3% better uh, to convey the story that we're trying to tell. Uh, and John, yeah, I want to bring you in here because we keep getting the, we get the art in. And like, I love my phone calls with you about comic book stuff and especially about art. So like, if I send you a, a link with new art and I get a call immediately, I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> so john like think about like when you first when i first came to you and i said hey we're gonna make comics like is this what you thought we were going to do um yes i just didn't think it was going to be at this level um and, and i don't want to rip on the stuff that was done in uh like the um the zine but that was not at this level right um it was good for what it was this little comic at the end of the zine the price point what we were looking for um, but this is, this is far and above that. Um, I don't know if you have the, like the, uh, the screenshots of Sally in space, but like, you know, and seeing how the art has continued to evolve, you know, even from this to like seeing some of the newer stuff that's coming out, it, it's, 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 I don't know. It, 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 it's, it's really cool. Um, like that's all I can say. Like there's, there's some, there's some of these like little sections and panels, that seriously could be on a wall as a piece of art somewhere and to see it like rotating in at that level. And then even with this, like what, what they did was you see all the stuff that's in pink, that's all augmented reality stuff to be able to call that out, differentiate that from the real world and what the uh, like augmented reality world actually looks like. It calls it out in a way that we don't have to explain it. It's just there 
And um, I think it makes it like the art has really helped enhance the story uh, quite a bit um, over, over the like past year that I've been seeing these things. Cause yeah, Jason sh saves it with me all the time. And also I'm an idiot. I don't know anything about this. So like they argue about the coloring or they argue, argue about the, uh, the lettering, they argue about all of this stuff constantly. And I'm just like, in, uh, you know, I'm just like, I, I don't know what the adults are talking about here, uh, but it does matter. And Jason's been great because he calmly and lightly explains to me kind of what they're talking about. Cause there's a lot of lingo and jargon in this industry. And uh, it really, really helps kind of see it like, Oh, okay. Now I can see what they were actually doing and see the improvements from one to the other. Yeah. All right. So one of the big things about comic books is the cover. Like the cover becomes almost its own thing, right? Like, uh, and so you kind of need some of the artwork to come in. You kind of need a feel for what's happening before you even get to the point where we're doing covers. And so what happens is a few cover ideas are sent to us. And then we take a look at uh, deciding which direction to go in. And so if you look on the far left here, you see like that's the original sketch came in and we chose that one versus the other ones that were suggested to us. And then the inks and pencils come in and then the coloring comes in and then you can see version one on the left hand side and version two just uh graphic designers hate this word uh, but it pops right <laughs> it pops just a little bit better my graphic designer just laughed on the other side of the monitor or, so like, <laughs> or slaps it's yeah. uh -huh. yes uh so the cover process and in comic book industry like covers are its own thing with variant covers and people who specialize in covers and things like that. Uh, so in the future, in the future, uh, you might see additional covers for the future as comics. Uh, but I just wanted you to see like the process of how this went through from what it was to what it is now. And then I'm going to move into the lettering phase. So lettering is where the comic, where spread script and the art come together finally and this is an art all amongst itself. Like the lettering of a comic book will either break or make a comic book. And so I'm a huge fan of going for the best letterer we possibly can get. So we got Eisner Award winning Taylor Esposito, who's worked with us before. Uh, and Taylor is phenomenal. And so Taylor has done the lettering for this. So Adam, explain like how the lettering process works, especially when like the words come in, like what happens then? Well, I mean, so... <laughs> Uh, that's a big that's a big question uh the lettering process when you're looking at lettering you know actually fred has has so much more to say about this and it would be a great uh, time to, to bring you in on this because i can talk about it but you do i i would say even many of my notes are just like yeah what he said so why don't you talk about the difference for lettering? Yeah. Well, you know, the letter, there's there's the obvious goal the letter has, the obvious job the letter has is to make sure all the words get on the page. And in something like TFI, where, um, you know, as John said, all that stuff in pink visually is uh, AR, the challenge is, 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 the, is this person a human being talking in, you know, uh, uh, real time? Is this an AI talking from a computer monitor? Am I on the phone with somebody who's a continent away? All that kind of stuff uh, the letter has to deal with. And you're seeing some of that right now in the variation between, you know, one, that character on the top of the middle page has got pink letters, but white balloons. And on the left, this fish character has square balloons. That Those all mean something in the reality of the world, right? So that's the obvious job. Uh, the subtle and, in my opinion, much more important job the letterer has is it's the letterer who guides you through the page. If you take your cursor or your arrow uh, in that left-hand side, that, if you go left to right uh, down, that's the, how the page is supposed to be read. You know, when you're reading prose, it's very simple. You have rows of letters and sentences and you just write, read left to right. In comics, it's not always that obvious. And so the letter, the letter is the, is the reading ninja, is the literacy ninja of the comics world because he's sneakily, uh, or she is sneakily leading your eye through the page to show you what order you should read things. So those are the two most, do we call that read order? And to me, read order is the most important thing um, that a letterer does, because if he does it incorrectly, it screws up the whole scene and screws up that whole experience and knocks you out of that verisimilitude, you know? So uh, 
uh, yeah, those are the two big things. The lettering and Taylor is fantastic at both. Jason, well, you're... The one thing we haven't gotten a chance to do yet with this issue. So this is the Martina issue. We act actually haven't shown you any of the original graphic novel that is a part of the Kickstarter. That's in progress right now. So this is the Martina issue. We've shown you some of the Sally issue. And so if you've backed those inside the Kickstarter, those will be right. coming to you either digitally or in print. And then we get to the uh, final part here where it's finished, printed, shipped, and in hand. Uh, this part here is a lot of work. Uh, and the, the scary part here is the printed part. I don't know about you, but I fear printing. I hate printing. And there's the permanence of printing. And so if you've never been a part of like printing a large scale project like this, it brings dread and just pain to your mind as you're doing and, it and until it shows up. And I don't help with that. Uh, we actually had one of our zines. We had like 3000 copies and mm. there was something in it that I didn't like. And I'm like, we're redoing the whole thing. Now, the good thing for the content community team is I'm, you know, BHIS is paying that bill. It's not like, you know, it, it was, you know, it's not that it's that big of a deal, but if something goes wrong, it, it's expensive and we have pallets of unusable product sitting in our warehouse that we have to get rid of somehow. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're very worried about that. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about going over and over and over these things and looking for the 1% increase. So really the best way to find a typo is to uh, pull it out of the box for the first time after it's been printed because yep. your eye will immediately go to the thing you've been skipping mm -hmm. for thousands yeah. of times. hundred percent. I I like to read backwards. Like I'm so used to reading the story and like I'm in, and I skip over a lot. So when I read it backwards, it forces me to read like every word. It's not fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Deb has a secret, like secret power. <laughs> Go ahead. That definitely shows the importance, though, of like having so many different people be able to take a look at it. Because yeah. everybody, you do get into those routines where you start seeing the same things and ignore others. Mm -hmm. uh, and having so many different sets of eyes on it, you everybody catches something else. Mm -hmm. now, one of the things I do strategically is I bring people in late to the project. And I'm like, okay, so you haven't seen anything for like the last couple weeks and I'll bring Serena in and she hasn't seen anything. I'm like, okay, could you please read through this? And then it's like, she's seeing it for the first time and she's catching two or three things that none of us caught the entire time where we bring Deb in at the very end. Uh, she hasn't seen the project until it's been lettered and we say, all right, so now I'll read it. And then she finds the two or three things that were uh, mistakes and we fix those. Or John and I do a table read where we read through and we're like, that doesn't sound like uh, you wouldn't use PowerShell there. You would use this there. So uh, that's another part of the process. And then finally, uh, you can join us on, on Discord at discord.gg slash RECA. Uh, you can also back this on uh, Kickstarter for 30 days. If you're watching this recording and it's over, then get ready for the second OGN, uh, which is coming at some point in the future once Fred has figured it out. If, if you're wondering, like we are now in the progress or process of doing this again. Mm -hmm. So take all the things that we just said and we're now in the process of doing it again and i am so excited that we get to do it again yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well and that i mean that, that was yeah, that, that, that's one of the things that i think is kind of funny about this whole process like working with you all right you know because you know i'm the one coming in with money and everyone's like you know well, we, we can do this, we can do that. And, you know, we, we sell this, we'll, we'll, we'll break. And it's like, I don't care. I, I really want to create something that's cool. And uh, that's the number one thing. We always say content community is like the engine that drives things forward and we can hook stuff onto it. And just to be able to go to a conference and have a line of people that's hours long to get something signed by Jack. And I guarantee you, like you will not believe what we have planned for the release of this. Like we have some insane things uh, that are coming down the pipe to make it an event and make it something that's special. And uh, like just once again, reading the last read through that I did of the newest script for the, the full graphic novel is just absolutely phenomenal. And I usually give a lot of notes to Jason that then get cut back and filtered before it goes to Adam. And then it gets cut back and filtered before it makes it to Fred. But this last time I read it, Jason's like, is there anything, is there anything you didn't like about it? I'm like, nothing. Like, it's just, it's such a good story and it's so, so compelling. And uh, that's what we're trying to do is create something that is super, super, super cool. 
um, and everything else will follow. And yeah, we're going to keep doing it and, you know, start coming to conferences here in about a year or so. We're going to have a big old stack of these things at the conference and we're going to be giving them out to the community uh, just because it's going to be that much fun. Yeah. Awesome. So to wrap up, uh, hopefully you learned how comics get made, like the process of it. You heard some behind the scenes of like how the story came to be. And if this is something that interests you and you want to back the Kickstarter, thank you. If you're like, nope. Totally fine. Thank you for enjoying this for the last 60 minutes. Uh, I'm going to go around to do any final thoughts, Fred, any final thoughts for today? Uh, thanks again. Uh, uh, I really love doing this book and I'm glad I, I'm, I'm, I'm equally as excited to pitch you guys what I came up with for the second book as I am for everyone else on the, the call uh, who's watching right now to read the first one. Yeah. Awesome. Adam, any final thoughts? Uh, I, you know, if you guys have half as much fun reading this as we've had making it, we will have had twice as much fun as you. <laughs> <laughs> Some odd math. I like it. <laughs> Deb, any final thoughts? Uh, thanks, John, for letting us do this because these people are uh, just, they've become friends of mine and I, any reason to hang out with them again, I will jump at. So thank you for letting us use your money, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Remember. Yeah. Remember, it all it comes out of all of our bonuses, Deb. <laughs> I'm fine <laughs> with that. It's our money. Totally right? fine with that. <laughs> Serena, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, no, I'm just super excited. I think it's like really cool that the Kickstarter, I mean, has been a success. That is awesome. So I'm glad that hopefully in the future we get to do more of these, you know, and have that art as part of our community. Yeah. Anthony, <laughs> final thoughts? Uh, yeah, just it's um, it's really been amazing to get to learn how the entire InfoSec world works uh, through this process. Like coming from a comic background, how comics are made, you know, that's more normal, natural for me. Uh, learning your guys' world has been amazing. You guys have been awesome to work with. And Fred has, I, I didn't get to shower him with praise this, uh, this time, but I wanted to tell him he's just done such a phenomenal job. I've, uh, I definitely eagerly await any new script that comes in. Awesome. John, Thank final you. thoughts? Nothing. Just, I, I am, uh, you know, I'm constantly in awe that, you know, I get to be part of this in some fashion. And, uh, and, 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 you know, we go back to the content community and Jason's got his notebook when he first came to work for me at Black Hat and had a hundred crazy ideas. And I think comic book was like in the top five. And uh, it's really cool to see for me, like for Jason, like getting to do his passion and his job and tying that together. Mm -hmm. And Jason, for the love of God, please stop traveling by trains and walking <laughs> halfway across New York. We, 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 we can afford to take caps as part of this project in the future. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, my final thoughts are I can't wait for you to read it. Like, seriously. I can't wait for you to read it. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. That is the end of today's first RECA webcast. And if you joined us, thank you so much. Uh, over 100 of you joined us today and over 114 backers right now. And if you're watching the recording, I can't only imagine what it is right now. So thank you. Thanks for backing it. Thanks for supporting this project. And we'll see you next time. All right, Ryan, kill it with fire, Ryan. Kill it. Yes. <laughs>